Please take your copy of God's Word. Let's turn together to John chapter 6. Our text this morning begins at verse 60 and runs to verse 71. And as you're turning, I express it for the whole congregation. Thank you, choir. That was fabulous. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Wonderful to have you all here. Really, really tremendous um, to have our friends from Westminster Academy leading us in worship this morning. Uh, as we come here to this passage here at the end of John chapter 6, I think I wrote this in the first word on worship. It's notable that uh, it looks as though the the interlocutors, the, the folks with whom Jesus is speaking uh, in this passage have shifted. The crowd in verses 22 to 24, the the Jews in verse 41, now the disciples in verse 60. It's likely it's the same people um, as they, uh, as Jesus speaks with them, they take on different guises, but be that as it may, um, the keynote of this passage, as we're going to see, is that some who profess to at least be attached to Jesus, to follow him, no longer follow him. Um, they leave. Others will stay. And the question then that comes is, what makes the difference between those who leave and those who stay? Uh, those who profess to be followers of Jesus, but then no longer do. And then those who remain with Jesus, who persevere for the long haul. Um, we're going to see that this morning. Uh, but in order to see it, we need the help of the Holy Spirit. So let's ask him for his help. Would you pray with me, please? Almighty God, we bless you. And indeed, we we echo what we've already heard. May the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord. We desire to hear the word of God and to think the word of God this morning. And so we thank you and we bless you for our friends from Westminster Academy this morning who've reminded us and prepared us to hear your word. And we pray especially that you would bless them as they continue uh, to, to sing these truths. But Lord, we, we ask now for a blessing for us. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would come and you would open our eyes of faith, that we might see glorious riches in, in this portion of your gospel. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So John chapter 6, beginning in verse 60. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come after me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So my kids will be probably the first to tell you that when I go out shopping, I don't really shop. Uh, their saying is, dad doesn't shop, he buys. Uh, that's, that's really different from my dad. My dad will shop and shop and shop. Like he'll, if he's going to buy a product, he will, he will scour the internet, go to multiple stores and try to negotiate with the sales guy who has really no authority to lower the price on what he's trying to buy. Uh, that's not me. Um, I usually get it in my head that I want X, whatever X is, and I will go into the store where I think X is most likely to be, and I will go directly to the item and purchase it and leave the store as quickly as possible. There's a problem, though, and that's sometimes I go to the store where I think X, whatever it may be, is likely to be, and they don't have it. And that begins what my kids will call the quest. 
the quest basically involves going to multiple stores where I think X may be, going directly into the store, looking for it, not finding it, and leaving it. And, and sometimes I'm successful. You go to four or five or six places and you finally find that thing you were looking for. But sometimes I have to get to the end of the quest and I realize, yeah, there's nowhere else to go. There's, there's no other place where I'm going to find this product. I still haven't found what I'm looking for, and the quest comes to an end. You know, you know, whether you know it or not, we're all on a kind of quest. We're all looking for, for all sorts of things, but particularly we're looking for things like security and significance and value and meaning. And so we go to this place and that place and the other place where we think we're, we're going to find that thing we're looking for. And we try and try and try, whether it's in the workplace, and as we crime our careers, or whether it's in some special relationship that eventuates in marriage, or, or perhaps it's in our kids, or in our grandkids, or maybe even it's, it's even in the service of the Lord, and in the process of being in a church. And, and we think, oh, if I can just go here, then I'm going to find it. I'm going to find that which, which is going to bring my, my quest to an end. It was Augustine who said that, that we have restless hearts. Our hearts are restless, he said. I think it was an indication that we're all on a quest and we're all trying to find these, these things that we think we most desperately need. But what happens all too often? We go to this place and we go to that place and we try this thing, we try that thing, and what do we say? Yeah, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. There's no place else to go. I've, I've run out of places to find the solution to my deepest desires. And that's the rest of the quote from Augustine, isn't it? Those of you who know it, our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they find their rest in you. I, I think ultimately what's going on in this passage are, are disciples, followers, those who've been walking with Jesus at least since the end of John chapter 2 when they saw the signs that he did in Jerusalem. And they, they saw the ways that he gave good gifts. There have been many who've been following him, thinking that perhaps by following Jesus, walking with him, they'll get the good gifts that Jesus gives, but they, they don't really want Jesus. And it's, it's part of their quest, isn't it? To try to find that which will actually fill their empty souls, that will bring their restlessness to an end. But for those who simply have a profession and haven't actually rested in Jesus, what happens? Well, they end up leaving. Uh, they end up, though they profess for a time to be attached to Jesus, they say, well, I tried Jesus. I tried Christianity. I tried religion. It doesn't work. So I'm going to go on another quest. But for those who stay, they come to confess like Peter did. No, where else shall we go? There's nowhere else to go. Jesus, you're the end of the quest. That's what God has for us, I think, in this passage. But we need to go a little bit deeper. And we need to think about these ones who leave. That is the keynote of the passage. It's where the passage turns. You, you see it in verse 66. Your Bibles are open, right? You can see it in your Bible. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. This group that was called the crowds, and then the Jews when they were oppositional to Jesus. Now they're, they're those who've been walking with Jesus, have been somewhat attached with, to Jesus, but now they've turned away. They, they're no longer walking with him. Why? Why did they leave? Well, this passage, I think, suggests two reasons why these erstwhile disciples, those who had some kind of profession of attachment to Jesus, leave following Jesus. And the first reason is... It really has to do with hard truths. That's actually what they say. You see it in verse 60? Verse 60 says, When many of the disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Now, we, we might want to read that as though these people were follow, who were following Jesus found his sayings hard, especially the sayings that we looked at last time. After all, Jesus in the previous section had said, Unless you eat my flesh or drink my blood, you have no part in me, you, you won't enter into life. 
And perhaps uh, that's what they're referring to, that this was a hard saying, and because they were interpreting it in in a crudely literalistic fashion, as though Jesus was recommending cannibalism. But but I don't think that's what's going on. I don't think the problem is that they found Jesus' sayings hard to understand. No, in fact, I think they understand all too well what Jesus is saying. I think, I think that these disciples, these erstwhile followers, know that Jesus is claiming to be God himself in human form. They know that he is telling them that their only hope for eternal life is to believe in Jesus in such a way that they're utterly reliant upon him. Moment by moment, day by day, constantly feeding themselves in faith upon Jesus. I think they understand perfectly well. And they see this as a hard saying. And you know what? It is. Y'all, the gospel is a hard word. Because the gospel actually calls you to abandon all hope for yourself based on your own doing based on your attempts to climb the ladder of of success or beauty or excellence or value, the gospel calls you to set all of that aside and to rest your heart in Jesus, to rely upon him, to, to receive him. We think that's easy, but friends, it's the hardest thing you'll ever do. Because it, it involves nothing less than a confession that Jesus is God and I am not. I'm not in charge. I'm not in control of my life. I'm not able to change myself. I'm not able to contribute a single atom to my own destiny. Jesus is God, and he has to do it all. You know what? Jesus knows we grumble about this. Some of you may be grumbling in your heart about it right now. What does that all mean? What is that preacher talking about? Well, the Jews were this crowd, these disciples, they were, they were grumbling about it as well. Jesus knew. But instead of softening what he said, what does he do? He actually doubles down. Look at what he does. Verse 61, Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. You see, Jesus here says, I'm the one who's ascending to back, back to where I was. Well, where was he? He was with God. He was with God from all eternity. And and as we already heard John say at the beginning of this gospel, because he's the word who is with God, what does that make the word that makes him God? Jesus is saying, I am God himself. But even more, God's spirit uses uses Jesus' words to give life to those who believe. And so this hard saying about Jesus' broken flesh and poured out blood as the only way sinners can gain eternal life, those words are actually spirit and life. And for those who believe the word of the cross, that, that's absolutely true. When you come to believe that Jesus' cross is your only hope for this life and the life to come, you confess, though it seems like folly to the world, this stuff, it's absolutely true. It's spirit and life. We saw that a few weeks ago. From 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where the Apostle Paul said, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's no wonder that these erstwhile disciples heard Jesus' hard saying, these hard truths, and said, this is folly. We we thought we understood what we were getting into when we professed to believe in Jesus. Jesus. We thought we were getting good gifts, but but Jesus is actually calling us to abandon ourselves to him and to utterly rely upon him and especially his violent death as the only way we're going to be saved. That's folly. We're gone. You see, for the ones who leave, they leave because the gospel is actually hard truth. But there's another reason here that Jesus gives why these leave. Not only hard truths, but but ultimately hard hearts. You see what Jesus says in verse 64? Jesus says, But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him 
by the Father. You see, in what Jesus says here, we have both sides of this reality. From the human side, the issue is that while, while they're, uh, well, uh, is that these erstwhile disciples did not believe. They've seen the signs. They've eaten the bread. They've heard the sermon. But they still do not believe. They've, they've hardened their hearts against the gospel. And even though they follow for a time, they're not genuine believers who exercise true faith. They had a profession of faith, but, but the reality of it was not in their hearts. But, but from God's side, the reason why their hearts were hard was because, as Jesus said, it, it was not granted from the Father for them to come to Jesus. And here's the sovereign purpose of God at work. And we might wonder, how do we reconcile these realities, both of which are true? That, that their hearts were hard, that they do not believe, but but the Father is the one who did not grant it so. We wrestle with that, don't we? And yet as important as those questions are, and in some ways they're less important than the existential questions of our own hearts, namely that, that we ask, what about my loved one who does not believe? Or, or what about my, my child who was baptized here in this church who, who doesn't believe? Or what about me? What confidence do I have that one year, three years, five years, ten years from now, that I'll still be following Jesus? That I'll still believe? I mean, that, those are the real questions. It's where the rubber meets the road. Well, here's where the rest of the passage, I think, gives us hope. Because it, it turns our attention from the ones who leave to the ones who stay. And, and it, it explains to us both what the difference is but also calls us to, to the, in the direction of what we're to do or, or where we're to go. I mean, Jesus turns to the disciples. After the, the disciples turn away, he turns to the, those who remain and especially to the 12. And he asks them, do you want to go away as well? Or another way you can render that, you don't want to leave also, do you? And the 12's response, given through Peter as, as their spokesman, it points us to the only place of hope, the only place of hope for anyone, whether it's a loved one or a child or for ourselves. It's not found in prying into the mysteries of how to reconcile human responsibility and divine sovereignty. Rather, the, the, the place where we take our hearts to hope is, is to rest our hearts in Jesus' own words. I mean, that's what Peter says. Verse 68, he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. He calls him Lord. Often in John's gospel, that's a honorific equivalent to our sir. But here, particularly, it's meant to call Jesus Master, Lord, even God, as we're going to see. And so Peter says, Master, there's, there's nowhere else to go. We've, we've gone here, and we've gone here, and we've tried this, and we've tried that, and our souls haven't found what they were looking for. There's nowhere else to go. No one else, no other teacher, no other guru, no other source of wisdom or, or hope or, or salvation. And there's nowhere else to go because you have the words of eternal life. You've just said it, Master. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life, and so it is for each one of us. That's what they're saying to Peter as their spokesman. And friends, that's, that's, our, that's your hope this morning for your loved one. That's your hope for your child. And ultimately, that's your hope for you. It's the word of promise. It's the words that Jesus speaks here. These words of life. Jesus is saying to you, if you believe in him, if you, if you receive him, if you rest upon him, rely upon him, you will not perish, but you have everlasting life. You will live if you cling to the word of promise that we all know that it's more than a banner at a football game, that, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And if you receive that word of promise and say, yes, it's true and it's for me, these are words of life. You will live. If you see Jesus' death on the cross, his crucified flesh, his poured out blood as your death, as for you and for your sin, if you rely upon that death as though it were food to sustain you to eternal life, Jesus is saying to you, you will live. 
If you see him as death's conqueror, submitting to the power of death for three days, only to emerge victorious from the grave, bodily, really, and for you, and you believe that because he lives, so will you, you will live. Friends, this word of the cross, this word of promise, Jesus extends to you as a gift. He extends it to you as grace, and all you need to do is to bring your quest to an end, is to stop running and receive it, is to rest upon this word of promise, is to rely upon it. But not only relying upon these words of promise, because friends, Jesus' words of promise are actually meant to, to lead you to Jesus as the very word of God. I mean, that's the rest of of Peter's confession, that that Jesus is ultimately God himself. You see what he says? Verse 69, Lord, to to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, verse 69, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You see, Jesus' words created faith in Peter and in the rest as the word of God, Jesus' word is are effective words. They are effectual means of grace, effectual means of salvation. As we saw in John chapter 5, Jesus' word does it all because Jesus' word affects what he purposes and promises. And that's what Jesus' words did for Peter and his friends to show him, to show them who Jesus actually is, namely the Holy One of God. It's interesting that that title that Peter gives Jesus, Holy One of God, it's used twice else in the Gospels, once in Mark and once in Luke. Both times, it actually comes from the mouth of ones uh, inhabited by demons, those in the spiritual realm who actually knew who Jesus was in his full glory. They knew that Jesus was the Holy One of God. Here in John's Gospel, it's it's used uh, as equivalent to the other titles we've already seen. That Jesus is the Word of God, that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the Son of Man. In other words, when when Peter is confessing on behalf of the group that we believe and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God, they were saying, we believe Jesus, you're God's own Son, that you are equal with God, and in fact, you are God's own self in human form. And the reason then, while these followers stayed, is because these external words of God, these words of promise given as gifts to us that if we believe in Jesus, we will be saved, produced and sustained faith so that we might believe that Jesus is God's own self and a savior for sinners like us. Friends, it's just as Paul said in Romans chapter 10, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of God. So what does that mean? What does that mean for, for those whom we love? What does that mean for, for our children who perhaps have wandered from the faith? What does that mean for us? Well, if, if we want our loved ones to come to Christ or our children to, children to trust in him, or if we want to sustain this path of obedience and discipleship, if we want to, to get to heaven safely, then, then we need to come to church. And we need to bring our children to church We need to come to that place where the words of Jesus are heard over and over again. Friends, if we want to trust in Jesus and continue to follow him, we need to remain in that place where we hear the words of Jesus repeatedly, regularly, weekly. Likewise, we need to reorient our lives around that place where we will hear Jesus' words repeatedly, regularly, weekly, so that when we move to a new city or we take a new job, we do so before we commit to moving or taking the job, we make sure there's a place where we're going to hear the words of Jesus over and over again. And we're going to commit ourselves where we live based on that place where we know that we're going to hear the, the gospel of Jesus again and again and again. We, we orient our lives around these words because these words are spirit and these words are life. I'm going to flip it around. If we absent ourselves from corporate worship, where the word of Jesus and the words of Jesus are preached to us, you know what's going to happen? We're going to find it increasingly difficult to stay. 
And we're going to find it much easier to leave Jesus and to leave those who follow Jesus. Our confession of faith actually teaches us that. That when we leave off the means of our preservation, is the language it uses in chapter 17, paragraph 3 of the Westminster Confession of Faith. When we leave off the means of preservation, we're in great danger. We're in great danger that we may not persevere all the way to the end. It's because Jesus uses his words to lead us to himself as the word. And so we need to be in that place where we will hear that Jesus is the one who dies and yet lives. You see, the cross is never far from Jesus, even here in John's gospel. We, we hear about it implicitly at the end of the chapter. You see it in verse 70, Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil, or actually better, the devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. See, earlier in verse 64, in this section, there's a parenthesis where we're told that Jesus knew who it was who would betray him. But, but here at the end of the chapter, we're told explicitly who that someone was. It's Judas, the son of Simon, from the town of Iscariot. He, as one of the twelve, would betray him, would deliver him over. And in fact, putting this all together, Jesus actually calls Judas the devil, the one doing the devil's work. And what was that work? To deliver Jesus over. To deliver him to whom? Well, to those who wanted to kill him, as as chapter 5, verse 18 told us. To those who would rend his flesh like bread, and who would spill his blood like drink. Deliver him over to those who would crucify him. And yet even this falls under the sovereign purpose of God and is under the control of Jesus because he's the one who chose the 12, which means he's the one who chose Judas. So that even this betrayal, even this being delivered over, even his death is under his own sovereign direction and purpose, which is nothing less than salvation. That his flesh would be rent and his blood would be spilt for you. Not just for the world, but for you. And so the question you need to ask yourself this morning is, are you ready to stop running? Are are you ready to stop going to these various places where you think you're going to find that which your heart most desperately longs for, whether it's meaning or security or significance or whatever it may be, and you're going here and you're going here and you're going here and you're going here and your heart still hasn't found what it's looking for. Yeah, you believe the kingdom is coming. You believe that reality is going to be shaped around this kingdom, but you still haven't found what you're looking for. Are you ready to stop? To stop running? And to put your trust in Jesus. To rest your heart and to rely upon him. To feed upon him and gain your nourishment from him so that day by day, moment by moment, you might say, Jesus, you're my hope. The hope of You're the ground of all my hope in this life and the life to come. I'm ready to be done running. I'm ready to bring my quest to an end. Will you say that this morning? Would you pray with me, please? Almighty God, we pray that you would do your work in our hearts and lives that are far beyond what we could ask or imagine. We know that for those who who are resting their hearts in the words of Jesus and the the word who is Jesus, they'll not be shaken. Though though life's storms come, though they might be plagued at times with doubts, in the end, you are the one who holds them firm. They've grasped hold of you only because you grasped hold of them first. But Lord, I do pray for my friends here today who perhaps have had a profession of faith but have been wandering around and they've been going to different places trying to, to bring their restless hearts to rest. Lord, I pray that today, today would be the day of salvation and they would rest their heart yet again in Jesus Christ. Grant us this grace, Lord, we ask. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.